Hello, I'm Simon Bowles. I'm the production designer of Avenue 5. The British Film Designers Guild was formed over 70 years ago with the aim of raising the standards and the profiles of the art department and protecting the interests of its members. Those core principles still apply today, with hundreds of members whose talents span all the various branches of the art department in film, television drama, light entertainment and commercials. Five curator, Armando Inucci. So yes, yeah, so we, we first met, about, I looked it up, it's three years and three wow. months ago, Arm. Um, um, and uh, we've been on an amazing adventure since. Yes, yeah, so I remember us having a design meeting while, while shooting David Copperfield. <laughs> we were in a field, <laughs> yes. we house, and, we, and you were laying out kind of floor plans of spaceships and so on. It yeah. felt, you know, what we, were, what we were recreating Victorian London outside it was bizarre you couldn't get a such a bigger contrast between no. the two worlds it was incredible yeah. but it's been wonderful adventure since since that oh, point good. um i'd love to ask you yeah what what inspired you to write avenue five because it well, is such an amazing kind of out there kind of idea to, to I, write kind of, I mean i've always been a huge sci-fi fan but i think sci-fi that i like or the one that resonates most with me is where they haven't gone completely crazy and anything people can float they can dematerialize in front of you but you know it suddenly becomes magic i although i kind of enjoy star trek and so on i've never really felt that that's my kind of voice i really like the sci-fi where just one thing has changed everything else is as you would accept it and they've just changed one thing so uh, and the practicalities of it were having done veep for hbo and I came home because I didn't want to be working away from home, really. Mm. They said, well, your next show can be set in the UK. And I said, good, because I'm, I'm a fan of space and we can shoot space anywhere. We don't have to go to Baltimore or wherever to shoot space. Mm. And, um, and they rather enjoyed the idea of a, a sci-fi sitcom or comedy. Um, and we took it from there, really. And discussing it, thinking about it. I wanted it to be about society. I was, you know, feeding off the strange kind of goings on today, the kind of group think social media mm -hmm. as acting, the, the, you know, the language of crowds, um, authoritarianism, information, Facebook, these huge corporations that have control over all, every aspect of our lives. Just. And, and I just arrived at this idea, talking with Simon and T Tony at the time, of a, of a ship out in space, a cruise liner, as it were, then just getting lost. So we basically have a society of six and a half thousand people who've got eight years, it transpires, by the end of season one, spoilers, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of come up with uh, rules from scratch, really. It's about that. So it's really a, it's more a kind of comedy about, how societies function really when all the rules when that when that supporting infrastructure is taken away from them when they have to start again plus at the center of it is captain ryan who at the start looks like the generic spaceships captain but with each episode we peel away another layer of his role to find out he's a complete fraud he's just been hired to look the part mm. and now suddenly finds he's actually got to act the part as well well, that's why it's a wonderful thing to, to, to design because I was reflecting your, your onion layers yes. of, of that, the, the pretense with the scenery as well. That's, yes, that's and these have... beautiful marble columns and these very solid looking gold bas reliefs are actually just polystyrene and you can peel them away and you can see the. the yes, other and also the that. fact that it, the, the bridge that we start off with looks like a kind of Star Trek bridge or a Battlestar Galactica bridge, but in the end, by episode three, we realize that none of it, it works. It's just there for the passengers to think, oh, this is the nerve center. Whereas in fact, underneath in a kind of grubby engineering pad is, is the other six or seven people who really know what they're doing, yeah. controlling yeah. the ship. And I like that. I like that kind of the ship becoming a, a sort of a metaphor, I suppose, of, of, of how we put faith in leadership and, I mean, a lot of my comedy, I suppose, feet and think of it was really about 
how these big imposing buildings you see in Washington and in Whitehall from the outside look like everyone knows what they're doing but as soon as you go inside you realize they're kind of making it up as they go along and this is a kind of an extension of that but we're saying this time people who claim to be in charge of the science your information you know hospitality business the economy yes. none of them really know what they're doing <laughs> And you did quite a lot of research for the, uh, the yeah. show. I remember you going to SpaceX. We went to SpaceX. And I went to Virgin Galactic in the Mojave Desert, went round there. And I went to Hugh, Laurie and I went round Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. Yeah. Right. Where, you know, the key bit of information, when we talked to them about long-term long interplanetary travel, Mm. You know, how will people cope with the radiation and radioactivity of space? And they said, key moment this, well, we find that a human, a ca an encasing of human feces is a very good absorbent of radiation and that should protect you. So, you know, the International Space Station is coated in shit and, you know, SpaceX to Mars will be will be coated in human waste. And I remember Hugh and I looking at each other thinking, well, there's an episode. Yeah, just, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And just also they, them talking about gravity and how everything has its own gravitational pull, which, where the idea of the coffin was circling the ship yes. was. And I, I, felt, I felt my work was done when the science consultant on Star Trek got in touch and said she'd spent the day doing the maths and yes, the coffin would circle the ship. Brilliant. Yes, it all worked out. <laughs> well, again, that's what was so lovely about designing it, because it wasn't, it wasn't like we were making kind of funny scenery or anything. We were making no, it, it had to be so sort of real. Possible. So things like yeah. the airlock re really had to work for us. To, yes. To, for the and night. I think in the early days, we also looked at sort of big international hotels, didn't we? Yes. Like grand hotels like in, in Dubai and so on. That was wonderful to be able to, 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 to show the opulence through the, through the vast negative space, the, the large open spaces, yeah. but then also in the rear of the ships, also to have large spaces, but, but they're yeah. dark and gloomy and yeah. smelly and dusty. When you're writing a, a script, mm. do, you, do you see the, the sets in your mind's eye when you're, when you're writing? And well, the... this was what, what was good. I mean, I, I, I knew that we wanted to not make it like a spaceship feel, that kind of Hollywood spaceship vibe. We wanted to have a few little nods to it for the benefit of the passengers mm. but also we principally wanted to look at the practicalities of it which is what alerted me more to hotels and, and cruise liners and you came into the conversation very early on and you were already doing designs while we were still outlining the bare yeah. bones of, of, of the season really and I think that's good and, and I was able to show the, the rest of the writing room, all your plans and your visualizations of how things would look, because it would give us further fresh ideas. Mm -hmm. You know, once you might have drawn something that was just an incidental thing, but we thought that's funny. <laughs> I'd do a whole scene about that, you know. Yeah, um, and I always like these elements to be introduced as early as possible. We always like to cast as early as possible, mm -hmm. so that we can write with the actors in mind. We can visualize. How they're going to deliver it or how they're going to look we like to kind of talk about costumes as early as possible yes. and i think the setting because this i mean really i didn't know what to refer it to because there is nothing you know it's a sort of leap in the dark in terms of how will the world look in 40 years time mm. and we kind of arrived at the notion that it wouldn't look radically different because if you think about 40 years in the past and today, not much has changed in the streets, really. There's a bit more glass. People yeah. are looking down at their phones rather than looking ahead. But it's not like everything has been torn down and replaced with big modern structures. I mean, old buildings still are there. I didn't want to invent a whole new world where everything was different and there was a new device for this and a new device for that. I rather like it when um, you just occasionally get glimpses of what this new world is like when we go and visit the office of the other president and it turns yeah. out to be a kind of tiny uh, alexa type thing 
in Buffalo, in, in the, ca the American capital of Buffalo. The, the design of the exteriors of Buffalo was like just images of Buffalo today, but with a few glass buildings and the electric, uh, automated non-driverless taxis and driverless vehicles. That's what we did, but we changed and we kept everything else up. That's right. Yeah. What the cast loved was just the level of detail on set. The fact that because it's owned by Judd, and we always spoke early on about Judd branding, that everywhere you go, there's a J. But you took it to, I, I have to say, quite an extraordinary, <laughs> like even, you know, in acupuncture, there's a, there's a J at the end of each needle. And <laughs> all the food is sculpted into the shape of J's and so on. When we had to go and film on location, because the Judd branding was so over the top, actually it kind of worked it kind of worked in our favour to when we shot on location, yes. that we could instantly juddify something by, as soon as you by changing... As everywhere, we were back on the ship, yeah. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So it didn't feel like we'd stepped off, off the, the lot at, that uh, Warner Brothers... No, the, the, the captain's table in episode seven is at a restaurant at Heathrow Airport, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but you wouldn't think, you wouldn't think because of all the jade, all the branding. Do you prefer shooting on location or in the set? Well, I don't it, know. Or? I mean, the thing about location is it always gives you a new thing. It's always exciting when you go to a new location because you just inevitably, you just like variety. So that's always new. What I like about shooting on set is it's so completely under your control. You can do what you like about it. You know, you can run around in it. You can come up with a whole new idea. And there's nobody saying, well, we've got to be out by Wednesday because there's a wedding on Thursday. Yes. You, know? <laughs> you know, you can. So I like that. I loved your, I love the meeting room, the big oak. I, I think we thought it was probably hollowed out from a giant redwood or something. That's it, yes. Uh, yes. Um, so I love So I kind of like the freedom that you have when you're on set. But there's always something exciting. I mean, the, the, mission control that we had at the McLaren Centre was, was amazing. Being able to put all our graphics in for real and have the whole amazing. 360 uh, effect in that was, was great, actually. We shot a lot there in very little time, but it really had an enormous visual impact across the whole season. Well, it just worked so well for us because we were really set out, you and I, to try and do everything as much as possible in camera yeah um without yeah. any green screens set extensions and things and and, yeah. and actually go finding mclaren and as you say it had all these screens yeah. 360 degree screens it yeah. was it was, it was it was perfect for us and again to, to apply the judd kind of branding to it really made it our own i have such a lovely memory of the um of going up and down in the elevator with right. you Oh, that's right. Somehow, yeah. We were fooled into like, nobody's tested it yet. Why don't you go in? <laughs> yes. We were the first to go up and down. Yeah. 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 But yeah. I mean, it was massive. But, but then, you know, we shot, you know, 80% of the show on that set. So it, it stood as, I mean, it was such a sad day when the fire happened. I think, I think, I thought you bore it very well, but very bravely because, yeah. you know, I felt so sorry for everyone who put all their, the construction team, the crew, and just everyone, and they put all that kind of 18 months into the whole planning and preparation of it. I know, it was really sad, but but yeah. because luckily we'd, we'd shot out of order slightly, hadn't we? So we'd shot, yes. we hadn't shot seven and nine, so it had yeah. to fire during eight. Yeah. So actually it's not like it's really missing. And in a no, way- And actually, nine was always planning, we always planned to be in a completely different part of the ship that we hadn't seen before anyway. Yeah. Uh, so we were lucky. We were lucky when, when the fire happened. It was the only <laughs> element of luck, the, the timing of the fire. But apart from that, it, it was devastating. You were very proud of, there were several things, all the curves and the 3D printing of a lot of the set and the, um, the lights within it. it yeah, the was, LED strips. Yeah, there was, yeah. I think it was like five miles of LED strips. It gave us, it gave, uh, it gave even our, our DOP, the, 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 it, it meant we could just change the lighting mood in seconds. Mm. And, 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 and then by moving a few things around, changing the lighting mood, we were in a whole new set. Mm. So it gave us that enormous flexibility, actually. Yes, that was the thing to, to try and, to try and create the, 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 the scenery as a blank canvas, which is why yeah. it was white, so that, so that any slight change of that color temperature 
yeah. in, within all the LEDs that were built into the set would, would change it drastically into a different, yeah. different yeah. environment or a different time of day. And, and just building in enough corners and shooting, and it always felt like we were visiting a new area. It didn't feel like we were still in this one big, you know, because physically we were in one big set. I don't think to the viewer it felt like we were in one big set. It always felt like we were constantly moving. In the, the bridge area, it was very clean. There was no personal, you know, signs of, of individuality at all. It was very, very yeah. controlled. Yes. Whereas you go, you lift the hatch in the floor, you climb down, and then all the monitors have got little flags yeah. and personal pictures stuck on the wall, and yes. and they're and kind of a wrap or something that's that's hung over the chair, and their spare jacket tucked on their chair yeah. and things. And a sense of people working late nights and stuff like yeah. that, you know. And, and yeah, because we put fridges in there with like drinks yeah. and and half-eaten um, takeaways that they've put. But I remember that that came partly out of my trip run. Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and we saw, they showed us the Pathfinder Mars uh, rover. Mm. And obviously the real one's up in Mars, but they had a whole fully working replica on Earth to kind of practice with. And there it was sitting, but in a kind of garage with dusty monitors, uh, a fridge full of tins, cans of Coke. I mean, it was so kind of incongruous. There's this thing very, very impressive, but on Mars, and then just drawers and papers and, and, and but that's how they did it. That's, I think the most, the thing that had the most impact was actually meeting the people who worked there mm. and realizing they kind of looked like they were your uncle, you know, who liked tinkering with cars. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Had yeah. a tool belt run, but they all had five degrees in astrophysics and engineering and, yeah you know, astronomy and, and, you know, they were all problem solvers, but they were also very practically minded as well. So it was trying to marry those two worlds. But that's one of the wonderful things about our job, I think, is that, that we get to, to, to kind of not snoop into people's lives, but to kind of explore, to, to, oh, to yeah. meet these people. Absolutely. And to ask these, the person that's really, the one thing they know about is what yes. we want to know about. Yeah, and they're yeah, like, yeah. what somebody at last wants to know about oh, no, my whole luxury. life's kind of <laughs> passion? That's a it's fantastic. Luxury around. And, and for a kind of space geek like me, going <laughs> around with JPL and going into their mission control where the, you could, we're still seeing the signals coming in from Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, yes. you know, that launched 40 years ago. Um, they're still getting them in. Uh, it was it was very very exciting. Yes. Oh, um, thank you so much for this. No it's pleasure. Really wonderful talking to you. No, thanks. Well, good life. luck with putting it all together. <laughs>The public never hear the set design from an actor's perspective ever. I mean, that never happens. You're right. We never get asked those questions about sets or props or you no. know the contribution to to our creative process or the creative process as a whole. So when I read those questions, I was like, I love these questions. You get asked about costume and you get asked about makeup and you never get asked about design. Yeah. And actually never. that's crucial to it because that's where, physically where you are, where you're doing your work. It's so yeah. interesting too, because specifically on Avenue 5, the sets, and, and I'm sure I speak for all of us, but the sets were, were a character on the show, right? Mm -hmm. Like the the interaction we had with the sets was as important to the storytelling as the interaction we had with each other. So there was something really incredible about that first day when we walked on to that amazing giant soundstage where you created that insane staircase and, and, and it was overwhelming. It was like, it was like that scene when they walk in, into uh, the, the factory in Willy Wonka and they yeah. see like, yeah. and they yeah. see it for the first time. It was, it, was, it, it, it was the fully realized idea of what Armando and the team had created on the page brought to life by your insane genius. And I think it was, uh, it was really important and it, and it was the only way that, that the show would have worked. You don't usually yeah. get that with like science fiction or anything futuristic. Like you, you're so used to having to use your imagination so much because it's kind of impossible to build the thing. You know they're going to do that in post. 
And so it was so unique to actually have the size and the kind of magnitude of this. And it was like no imagination required, like you were actually in the world of the show straight away. Yeah. Yeah. And I also, I think like the size and the magnitude also are central to the whole theme of the show, which is like, these appearances are not to be believed, right? Like the, that in the case of Hugh, his wig and his bearing and his his outfit are just like very thin camouflage for the shrieking incompetence that lurks just beneath the surface. And I think that's true of the individual characters, but it's also true of the environment that is this gilded, awesome, space in which people are just as shabby and even the ship is just as shabby because the ship gets knocked off course yes yeah. there was something about the scope that 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 added to the sense of humor of the entire uh show and i i don't know if i've ever experienced that without but zach is right without it being like gimmicky uh or anything like that it, there was something about this the scope of it but the sort of the softness of of the curves and the corners, which you know we need for comedy, we need we need either to see someone coming down a, a long hallway, right, <laughs> or we need some to turn, or we need to look at someone around the corner because there's there's a lot of secrets on this ship too, right? So it's important that we you know have an intimacy when there's a scene happening, but also we need sort of the grandeur of the, the scope of the ship and that and that set in particular uh, lended itself to both those and, and uh, both those scenarios and everything in between for like american sets it's you don't usually have like a full house you have like there's the kitchen and then like it's a separate standing set for the living room and so you never feel like you live right. on it but to know while you're mm. in a scene that your actual room is down the hall and to the <laughs> left, like was very cool and really made you feel, especially when we would be shooting for long hours, like like you actually lived and were trapped there. Uh, you know, Simon, I'm also, I, I think one of the revelatory things about, about the sets on the show, uh, we've discussed the grandeur, but also the intimacy, like, there's something just so defining, as Rebecca said, about each of our cabins that gave such insight into the characters. Like, I remember the first time I saw Matt's cabin, for instance, I was just like, well, uh, this tells us everything we need to know about <laughs> Like, e everything we just genuinely need to know about the character here, yeah. right? Uh, same, same with sort of the faux reality of of Captain Ryan's cabin and how it represents the idyllic version of the would-be captain but is like him bullshit. That sushi restaurant that that, that blew me away because I don't oh, know if I that love that restaurant. plan but I remember I remember just being told oh we're gonna do this scene you know or a couple of scenes in a sushi restaurant. And it was astonishing, <laughs> absolutely. It was the most beautiful sushi restaurant I've ever yeah, There was a tree. <laughs> Wasn't there like a live tree in the middle yeah, of it? Like in the middle. Yeah. Yes, in the middle. It was unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. Did you guys see Spike's cabin? Oh, yes. No. Yes. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. <laughs> that, it informed the character better to me. It smelled like Spike. Like they put patchouli. <laughs> I just I remember walking in and you. smelling patchouli. Like I remember yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it was Woodstock. That, that's it was part of the, the process, isn't it, for an actor? Like you were asking Simon, it's like, you know, you don't actually get to see the house you live in, the room you live in, the office you work in until usually the day of the shoot. And you have to take in so much information mm -hmm. about your character right there on the spot. And so sometimes between rehearsal and your first take. And what's so great about what you do is that you just give so much detail about the character that you can actually start to play with and like embellish your your own storyline with it's it's mm. sort of part of the improvisation i guess in a way yeah, yeah. because that's the thing it's a really i have to do such a big leap of faith my kind of my, especially my set decorator uh, liz griffiths because we you know we don't know you know we have to kind of like foresee the characters your characters and you're creating them with a director and we're not often not in even rehearsals as well 
So we're having to kind of like down to this, like what kind of pen would they use? What are the glasses, that mm. character, how, you know, these kind of choices. So we have yeah. to be really, really good at kind of jumping into to each of the characters as we read them and, and the snippets that we're hearing. And that's why I always want to come to a read through because because even from that, the way that you're, you're portraying a character, even just sitting down and, and reading it from the script, I can pull so much from that and, and try and produce it, you know, on the set um, for, for when you arrive, yeah. That's, that's something that isn't talked about a lot. I mean, actors, we sort of have it easy with improvising because we can just try it and if it, but with, with set deck and production design, especially working with Armando, we're asked a lot about the improvisational style and, and all that stuff. But when you have to turn around, I remember one time we like, we did a gag, someone in the rehearsal did a gag about those Judd cards, those Judd coupons. And later that afternoon, those Judd coupons were on set being used. I think the Spike book too, that is in Spike's room was talked about like that he wrote a book and they came up with a title and all of a sudden that was in his room. I mean, improvising uh, from a production design level is I think probably loads harder than what we have to do. Um, and I, I, I don't hear that spoken a lot. I mean, it, can you speak a little bit to that, Simon, in terms of working with Armando, knowing that things are, are fluid like that, but also the sort of the major things you've already decided about the set have to kind of be consistent? Sure. I mean, it's wonderful working with Armando because exactly for that reason, that, that things do keep on developing. And, and as we know, enough you know, pages come in overnight and, and new fresh ideas. I kind of handpick my team to, for people who are totally on board with that. And, and, and who are excited by it. And actually, as you say, with that book in Spikes, it had to be a pop-up book, really specific things. Every single one of those changes, it can be seen as a big drag and a big pain, or it could be something that's gonna actually improve the final drama. There's also something really interesting to, to Kyle's point about the, the, like, the comedy that comes from the timing of your set is something that people don't even think about, but like, my favorite episode of the season is episode eight, the airlock, uh, the airlock uh, episode. And it, part of the reason that that episode is so frightening and so funny and so- That's the thing is, it's, um, I, mean, I never wanted the set to be funny, any of the sets to be funny because the, the, the funny thing is the characters and, and, and the situation and the escalating situation. I have to say that room, our room was so much smaller than I thought it was going to be. I was like, so you felt like I cannot believe I'm stuck in here with this <laughs> asshole. And when he like has to sleep on the couch, it's like this tiny half bench that he can barely, he has to like cling on to. It, it makes me think honestly about quarantine. It'll be really interesting when we come back because I think we now all have the sense of what it's like to be trapped somewhere, you know? And yeah. even though there are these gigantic wide, you know, like spaces, it's like when you see the same four walls over and over again, it really does start to make mm. you feel mentally insane. Hence the fact <laughs> I'm in my car. Um, <laughs> Nikki, we never went, I don't think we ever saw McLaren before it was transformed. What, like, what was that whole sitch? It was wild because it's such a sort of architectural kind of gem, isn't it? It's fut it looks futuristic. It kind of screams excellence everywhere. It has like <laughs> glass, you know, glass offices, glass panels everywhere, so there's no privacy, which I think is sort of weirdly aggressive. Um, and, <laughs> then, and then the place that we shot a lot of our stuff was like an amphitheater, wasn't it? It was in the round. Yeah. And that's where they present all the new cars in this very kind of James Bond-esque room. And then it has this um, dais, you know, stage in the middle that that revolves it was wild but again so sort of fun and informative because you have to take ownership of that space like it requires somebody who's not intimidated by that space um and it's quite theatrical so you feel like you have an audience which is something that worked quite well for me getting into character um but it was just really impressive wasn't it simon Yes, it was an amazing space. We're so lucky with that. I'd seen photographs of the kind of the, the glass offices and things like that. And I knew I'd want to try and get in there and shoot. And I've tried actually on three other projects and not managed it. And this one, 
clicked. I think because really? of Armando as well. That's probably why. But, but yeah, they were showing us around. They're like, oh, we've got this round room. Probably interested in the room. It's like, wow. <laughs> So, um, and, uh, and not only is it a round room, but they had real projectors all around the side. So, so all the graphics you saw were, were real, real oh, live no graphics. Wow. Wonderful. Wow. He says it was, a, it was an amazing kind of space to be able to work in, to, to, you know, to present these, these key moments on Earth. You brought up an interesting point about a character having an attitude uh, or an approach to an environment. So, and my immediately thought of um, Judd's bedroom it, it's so grand and it's so ornate and Josh has to play that this is normal for him, right? <laughs> and, and we're awed by it and, and, but we also have to play that it's, uh, that it's normal for him, it might not be normal for us. You know, like there's so many levels to play about our attitude about a space and um and that you know and and that has to do with status and it has to do with mood and it has to do with so many things um one of the things i really enjoyed actually was was because you know um andy and i get to transition from one cat from from a sort of fairly ordinary cabin a doug and mia style cabin to this luxury cabin and and that's you know sort of all, all to do with karen's um excessive greed and ambition and that whole scene when Hugh first bribes me with the with the luxury cabin, um, that scene was rewritten actually on the day. It was sort of, you know, like a lot of scenes are, there was lots of additional material. But a lot of the reason why it was rewritten was because the difference between the cabin we'd been in with the with the window they didn't work properly and they would no, you know it was fixed on a horrible landscape and then suddenly you're in this massive, enormous, luxurious space. There was so much richness in that that in fact a lot of the jokes in that scene that finally made it in are to do with that, just how long it takes Karen to walk around <laughs> that room. The, the beaded curtain, the fact that when I lay back on the bed and then this thing of him going and sitting on the sofa and beckoning me over and me, that's quite a journey, you know, for me to have to, <laughs> so she actually has to say, do you want me to come over there? Because it's not just gonna happen, you know, you're gonna have to ask me to do that. And all of that created this brilliant atmosphere, but we couldn't have foreseen that. We couldn't have improvised that without that set because we didn't know what the space was that we were going to be working in. So it's like you said, Josh, it is, it is just another character in the show. In the end. Conversely, uh, what I was fascinated by is your work, Simon, what ins is seemingly inspire the writers to then put more opportunities for the set to drive storylines. Like, I I'll never forget the episode where all the guests come to Judd's cabin and he shows off all of these insane relics that he's collected over the years. And it just, it seemed to be like inspired by the insanity of this environment that we played in sparingly, but that was, as Susie said, so impressive and so vast and so ordinary for me but extraordinary for anyone uh, who's coming from a lower class and i and i thought that that was so amazing that that like that a set would drive a storyline when i walked on the set the first time i remember feeling like it was like almost all the white was really surprising to me and like it almost felt like a greek villa or something like that did you have a uh, inspiration you know obviously it was in the future but did you have an inspiration that you kind of played off of from the past? I never wanted it to be a white white I, I that's why I built those LED kind of colored LEDs into everything so that so every single light in the on that set on the, the atrium set was um, controllable so we could kind of dial it warmer for some scenes and cooler for others and then really kind of like blue for nighttime scenes so that, so we had that ability to to kind of play with play with the set as a blank canvas that we could then project kind of color and atmosphere and flash them red for an emergency and things like that so that's cool um, but i knew in my heart that i really wanted it to be as big a contrast to the to the the grungy dirty side as much as possible so so that's why and also to be ridiculous in that everything is 
you know, heavy. So like there was like pure marble columns running up through the sets, you know. Right. Why would you, why would you make that in space? Why would you bring gold yeah. <laughs> marble into space, you know? Um, and also for the whole jar to kind of feel, I wanted it to feel, you know, style over substance. Um, like the big gold image of, of Judd. Because yeah. 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 <laughs> I, I had to design I, that like I like a year you, before we started know, shooting. I brought my parents to set, you know, and they, it's like often like what you were saying, Jess. It's like you, the, the idea of a of a film or television production very rarely lives up to the. But walking my parents around that set, it was like. They were agog. I don't think I've ever used that word before, but they were <laughs> legitimately agog. They were fully agog. <laughs> That's why I wanted to come around the set with you. You know, I, I was the uh, the production office and the ads were on strict instructions that the first time all of you kind of came, even if you're on your own, I wanted to be there to 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 take you around to live that moment with you, but also that they would probably get lost on the set because it was so big. So. Yeah, <laughs> my mom starved to death on that set. Yeah. <laughs> So do you, when you're reading the script, do you actually see the sets or do you imagine the environment? I come from theater. So when I read a script, it, it, I have to picture a fairly neutral space mm. um, because I also don't want to rely on things for performance that will, might not be there when I, you know, on the day. And so I either picture a very neutral space or a black box even sometimes, or an environment that exists already from a movie that I know. So, mm -hmm. so my introduction to the set is always a surprise. It always informs everything um, because I have to sort of pr preserve all of that uh, to, to ultimately contribute to my performance. Does that make sense? Susie, what, sure. what pre-existing what pre-existing movie did you imagine three men and a baby for this one? <laughs> it's always, to be clear, Susie told me it's always three men and a baby. Always. It's gotta be three men and a baby. That's the only movie I know. <laughs> if you fix too much in your mind, then you can get stuck when you get on set because I think a lot of people don't know that even if you're on a grand set like like um, Avenue 5 is quite often you're negotiating quite small spaces because of crew and there's just a lot of people on it so you have to be really open to kind of adjusting in the moment to what is being offered to you like the prop master might just suddenly hand you something and you have to just in that moment kind of take ownership of it so that's kind of my process is quite similar this, this particular process was even more shocking and startling because we were rehearsing in these very like very low rent rooms <laughs> with you know very flat surfaces very shitty lighting and so like having to begin the process in a place of, of true imagination in rehearsing and, and hearing you know everyone be like oh and there'll be this thing here and this thing there and having to sort of do that math in our heads and then walking onto your set and being like, wait, what? It was one of the biggest contrasts in, in, uh, in, in terms of like prep to reality that I've ever gone through. Cause like usually when I do a movie, I come to set and I start the process and the rehearsal is the morning up. There's yes. no weeks of prep. You don't have that luxury. So no. the, the, it wasn't like that. It sounded like this was a very unique process. The the open atria. I mean, the, the the main part of the ship that the the three level with the working elevator was always so striking, and and I always felt so proud to be there and so mm. excited. And then, and I was it was just like, I we were we're making movies, and this is make believe, and, you know, which will be interesting this year. You know, all the background artists that would be there, and how we were really doing it just felt like we were doing something special and big and neat and it was just so um such a great vision such a bold vision that i just loved being part of it every time i'd walk in, the, in a big open space how important are props to you? Yeah, that's props, the ones that you pick up on hold is that a, 
Anything you can tell us about that from a, from an actor's point of view? When I was coming up in improv, they said, when in doubt, go to your environment. And so that is uh, something that we, that I do, which is where like, I, I use whatever is in my hand or that I can touch or that I can see uh, to either help the scene, raise the stakes, uh, inter you know, relate to another character um, because because as people, we do that in real life. When, you know, when there's something that we don't want to talk about, we stare at the table and we try and remove that errant piece of scotch tape off the surface. You know, that's part of the human process. And so what is before us and what we are holding is essential to, to you know, playing a person and especially essential to relating to another person for me. I think as you as you were saying, uh, um, Nikki, that you know, you get handed stuff, and it's always a, it's always like just before the cameras start turning, and so you're you're suddenly holding this thing, thinking, okay, well, how do I relate to this thing? Um, but when the props are beautifully chosen, as they always were on this, then it is just the perfect thing because it absolutely makes you think, oh, okay, I get it, I get why she's walking like this or why she's exhausted because she's carrying this thing around, or there's always a reason for something. Um, and so, yeah, a prop can absolutely change your your whole kind of energy in that scene. I think also the, like for our room, it was so lived in. So like, I never asked for makeup to be there or certain pieces of jewelry, but it really helped you lose yourself in the scene. And then even use, like at one point I, I had a compact that I ended up using to like punctuate the joke, but it's like, yeah. Yeah, like a clamshell. Like I think it was somebody's <laughs> vagina snapping shut. Yeah. <laughs> but like as actors, we didn't need to ask for that to be there. You know what I mean? It was just there. And it was so cool to get to like in that because a lot of times you are improvising in the moment in these scenes. So to get to like just have all these things at your disposal was just like an embarrassment of riches. Yeah. I find it really comforting having props. I think I've learned over the years to really rely on that. Like you're at home learning your lines you're getting nervous you're thinking I don't know what I'm gonna do with this with this scene and then you actually realize you don't have to know what you're gonna do because you know like Susie was saying actually part of it is you're gonna find out on the day what the environment is I also feel so grateful in any part of production when someone wants to play with you you know what I mean like yeah. when you're engaging in, in, in it's you're all playing this sort of grand game together and because it makes you feel well for just the obvious reasons but also like when for example with matt's cabin you simon you were, it was so it's so wonderful because i can feel you i could we talked about it i could feel your excitement and you said to me you're like i'm gonna overdress it i'm gonna put all this stuff in and then we're gonna go through and find which things feel perfect you know so just having that, someone saying, I'm going to array a, 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 a little toy store for your character, and then we're going to go shopping and take what, and you can t pick any toys you want. You know, I mean, it's so moving in a weird way, it, it, because it, it makes it, uh, um, there's like, I'm obsessed with the Velveteen Rabbit, and in that book, they talk <laughs> about how like, when you love something, it becomes real, you know, if you love something, and and yeah. and when somebody else loves something that you love, like you love your character, and when somebody else cares enough about that to also pay attention in a really detailed, imaginative way, their love makes your character feel more real. Does, does mm -hmm. that make sense? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah exactly. You gave me like, photographs of your um your grandmother as well to yeah. put on the on the wall. So there were real kind of personal things to you as a as a performer. And I really yeah I I, I love dressing that set for you. <laughs> so thank you so much. It's so wonderful. Thank you. you. You're thank all away. And thank I'll see you, you hopefully okay. in the new year. But haven't you Yes, yeah, thanks so Bye. Bye guys. Thank Love you, you all. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much for coming along and being part of this um, uh, this little talk uh, about Avenue 5 and the design of Avenue 5 for the British Film Designers Guild. One of the things that'd be nice to talk about is actually the um, the way that the, the the on Avenue Five, especially that the script developed in in prep, 
and then there was um, there were new ideas coming up during the shoot, uh, you know, like for overnight for the next day, and also the way that Armando kind of uh, encourages improvisation on the on the set and how that impacted on us. It was a kind of kit of parts, I think. I think we had, you know, lots of people in set deck manning the decks just in case. So, um, yeah, it kept us on our toes, but just to have enough people. So, you know, particularly the action props buyer during the shoot was kept in extraordinarily busy. Um, but we tried to find out as much information as we could. Um, and we got a kit of parts of fabulous lighting and props and furniture that uh, were multifunctional that could come to our aid whenever we needed them. Yeah, that's one of the things that really that we all set out to, all three of us set out to do, was to create this environment that was very adaptable. And actually, it's almost it was the 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 lighting and the dressing that kind of informed us that we're in a different part of the ship at any point. You know, we'd done our research. We'd been to uh, the design shows. We'd been to Decorex, and I'd been to Major Nob Show the year before. And we'd seen what's out there and kind of thought, let's try to make it something different. Let's kind of make it something that people haven't seen. This is a great opportunity to create the new. Um, so that from your original designs and drawings and the vi virtual reality with your art, it was like, you know, anything's, any options are possible here. Let's go as creative and as integral with the set and the lighting and the look of it as we possibly could. And I think that's what comes off when you see the show. Yeah, well, I was going to say, I mean, like you said, like adaptability, I think flexibility, uh, adaptability, but was what came to mind for me. Like from the, from the beginning, you know, we wanted to kind of give Armando an environment and, and the cast and everybody an environment to sort of make it the best it could be in the moment. So even even if we started shooting a scene on one set and and maybe Armando, maybe one of the cast said, actually, this would work better on that set. We always wanted to have that sort of flexibility where we could just do that. And whatever that may, may be, maybe it's a set, maybe it's a prop, maybe it's a time of day. We just wanted to sort of make everything as flexible as possible. So if in the moment some bit of impro improv or some idea, you know, I mean, you saw it, you know, I think in episode one, there's the make the restaurant lights red. I'm pretty sure that was an on the day thing, or, or at least it was like... Uh, in the lead up to shooting very last minute right and it was like okay yeah we can we can do that we can make them red because we'd sort of done our homework um and that just extended to everything i think so right from the beginning it was always about how we sort of stay out of the way how we can kind of create an environment where they can just do what they do and we sort of stay out of the way and facilitate what they need because obviously we had to start designing all that lighting into the set before Evan, before you joined us so so yeah. We were just like that, which is why I was. I tried to leave it as flexible as possible. I was building it into everything. Mm. There were LEDs in every single surface, and because yeah. they had this kind of wide range of colours, it took you to come along to to then you know even. The, I love the way that you use. Sometimes you used a warm and a cool next to each other, so that so the lighting um, had more interest and depth rather than just being one uh, one kind of flat area. So I wanted things to always have a bit of a bit of interest. And so I, what I definitely set out to not do was just light things like studio lighting. Everything's perfect. It's just the perfect color correction. It's all flat and perfect. I always wanted it to be a little bit warm or a little bit cool or have a little bit of something. And so the LED just gave us that kind of complete flexibility to the point where, you know, the directors would even tune into it. And would say, "Oh, okay, you just you made that go a funny color. Can you show me that again?" And we could just bring up a, an app on a you know iPad, and they could even just do it themselves and just just move around on the color wheel and go. The purple's pretty nice. Should we play with that? And then you just, yeah, great, let's do that. Um, and you know, obviously in the old days, you'd be gelling things, and it would take a week. Um, and we could just press a button and it changed. So that was great. And, and uh, the practicals really were the same. I mean, we had we 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 talked about everything so much. We had everything in the set. But then, if we ever did find ourselves in a dark corner or looking somewhere unexpected, you know, we had these various options of things that we could just move in. Um, and they seeding film lights in in plain sight, dressed up as props, which was great. That's yeah. how we knew that we were going to need to do that because because yeah. we the way the 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 improvisational way of the armando works is that everything is the set he's allowed to go anywhere and and we yeah. want to encourage that 
um, without saying, no, 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 you can't look over there because that's where all the lighting stands are or anything. So, so that's why yeah. we, we, were, we, we set out um, with Liz and her department to, to, to really to incorporate the lighting into everything so that, so that things appear to be fairly evenly lit so the actors can go anywhere and if they suddenly decide to turn right halfway through a scene, then, then they can. Um, yeah. To kind of like really make sure that, that there really isn't, even the back of the scenery, even where you kind of go right around the corner, even right around there, it's still painted and there's still graphics just in case. <laughs> when we were coming up with the ideas of what these lights are that were like architectural four meter five meter long lights that need to be in the surface of all this all the ship you know we were looking at these kind of curvaceous lights and ended up being called blister lights that we created and that was really important and the columns that you designed that, that, that had this soft bejeweled column you know lots of soft box type thing yeah. of all this lighting and that and you know we were at the forefront of modern technology you know that wireless practical lighting yeah. that we we developed and we put in all of those icicle table lights um and the bedside lights we use that yeah. throughout the show and i think that's probably the first time that i've seen that actually happen with the, you know the, the the operator being able to as you say flick on anything um and it all being this massive real world of the, of the spaceship yeah it was those big those big sort of columns those big pillar lights it was those that if any time we could block a scene around those it always looked great they were, they were brilliant yeah. and like like the, the huge chandelier in the conference room you know a different opportunity to do something crazy yeah, with lighting. Yeah, yeah. you know this amazing big chandelier which you know lots of people with small hands put nd in those big long three meter column yeah. that there were 150 of you know i think i think you and i talked about it, wouldn't it be great if we could offer Arm that he starts up on the sort of second floor in the atrium in one back corner and we could walk and talk into an elevator, get in the elevator, go down, come out again, go up and back up the other side and essentially do a kind of, oh, I don't even know how long that would take, three minute walk maybe um, across multiple levels. And, and I think we kind of set that as a kind of personal challenge for us. So that was always in the back of my mind that we'd have lit little areas, little scenes that we could control, but we also needed to link everything together. And of course, you know, if we're, if we're on one half of the set, we're using the other half of the set as a background. So really it just all had to sort of work and, and sort of flows. Well, it's, it's important to kind of create the big wow, but also be able to bring it down and have those kind of intimate moments. So, you know, um, Matt's cabin was something that was, um, it was a revamp of something that we, we were using in a corridor set. It was a totally different feel. It was lots of, photographs it was good contrast to uh, Ryan's first class cabin or any of the larger wonderful big uh, spaces there was I love that juxtaposition between between the the the, the uber opulent and the, the tiny tiny kind of like you know quite <laughs> down to earth um yeah. Yeah. i mean jokes was just great fun you know let's go mock versace let's go as blingy as possible <laughs> and you know in put an insignia everywhere we possibly can in the floor in the ceiling in the carpet everywhere in the furniture um and let's you know make it all about him and his ego and you know all the details were still on his desk were really personal to him you know the three faces figure the the hands all the the personal artifacts that he thinks appropriate you know like skulls and and um extinct animals and kind yeah, of really yeah. eclectic things that table, yeah. the judd world had you know and i remember that the furniture came from rome was that right or from Italy? yeah from a little factory you know that we we spoke to and um that they had this mock versace stuff and we we're like fantastic armchairs cyborgs yeah. sofas yeah um, and then we blended <laughs> it in with other furniture that we found in antiques uh furniture places and markets. Obviously, if you're set in the future, everything, you know, a majority of props and furniture are going to be made bespoke to that. But also because our theme was so strong on board the ship, you know, it's almost like very, very few things uh, were, were purchased and a majority were either uh, recovered or repainted or, or just built from scratch. I mean, like the bar furniture, we, we, we sourced some wonderful um, bar furniture that we in um, Porto and it was covered with the gold insignia and, um, you know, the bar stools and everything like that. 
nothing was was as it was it was all bespoke like i think you had three concept artists at one point that were producing the the visuals for the food for the furniture for the gadgets i mean that was something that the the that I think was very important to be able to demonstrate our ideas as visuals. And it's much easier to, to send a, a visual, a beautiful color visual uh, of, of, of the idea rather than trying to explain it down a telephone to one person that has to explain it to, to 10 other people. So, um, so yeah, that's just the, right. the way that flow of information went really well. Because the set had been designed um, with VR, so we could right from the get-go put VR headsets on, walk through the atrium, go into Mia and Doug's cabin, have a sneak around um, the airlock. You know, so from the set deck department, we needed that 3D modeler that could design you know, the conference table and let's see what it looks like from underneath, let's see if it fits into that space. Um, you know, and anything that was as that i wanted to create like the all the sculptures on top of the plinths and um any lighting we, you know we could create that within set deck and get as you say a concept artist to to draw that up under our, our thought process and then put it actually physically put it into this 3d set that you'd done you know it's incredible so in terms of forefront of technology we 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 try to do our utmost to use it so it would show to the actors and, and arm amanda you know. About, um, you're saying about big spaces and small spaces. I, one thing that I thought was great was when we went to the sort of the back of the ship, like the engineers, um, what do we call that? The engineers? Yeah, the kind of below decks. Below decks stuff, yeah. It was the detail down there because suddenly we were in a much smaller, normal styled set, but we still had this sort of attention to detail that there was so many sort of little bits of trivia, you know, little, little funny little jokes. Um, and, and just incredible detail in terms of, I just thought the sort of the rusting work down there and the aging, things like, you know, just coffee cup stains, that kind of thing that just made this sort of sci-fi place feel like a real location, I thought was great. So for me, that was what was brilliant is we, we did have these huge, massive, modern, ultra modern sets, but we also had these sort of grungy small sets and both I think held up incredibly well. So yeah, it was a real treat to go to the back of the ship just to be completely different. And that still, I thought just gave us so much flexibility and so much to work with. Because I always wanted to, to pull those two worlds apart to, to have the, the passenger mm. area is uber, uber clean and sharp. But then when we do go into the below decks area, it's just such a visual feast that you're almost like a yeah. hero by a wave of detail and aging and textures and, and history yeah. and, and character and stories in the dressing. Um, yeah. But then also to then take another step further, which is to go to, to Earth as well. Um, so that was our kind of our third environment that, that we explored in the series. It is the below deck stuff, you know, each one of those desks was a character, you know, I really enjoyed yeah. doing that. I enjoyed sitting there and thinking, what does this guy do? Does he, you know, is he sorting, is he an electrical guy? Is he kind of part of the engineering? Who is he? You know, so I kind of liked all that character. Each, each area was a different character. Um, and then the on earth stuff was much more kind of, kind of corporate, but kind of a bit more bland corporate. So it was, it was, it was miss, um, missions that they'd done before, you know, they had the trophies on the sideboards, um, but they weren't so kind of exciting maybe as, as what's happening now in space. Um, you know, it was just to try to kind of, you know, diff do different colours and, and, and make it a different feel there, you know, than, than the kind of grunge world of more re real people, you know, that you relate to as opposed to the others that you might not relate to so much. Well, listen, thank you so, so much, both of you. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Your, thank you so much for joining us today. I've been looking forward to, uh, uh, to talking to you about uh, Avenue 5. Yeah, no, uh, thank you so much uh, for, for having me on. I'm really excited to shed some light on all the mysteries of the, you know, coming up with the sets. And yeah, it's just been, been an awesome project, so I'm happy to talk about it. Yeah, and I suppose that my experience in, you know, video games industry and product design in industry uh, really uh, helped with, with, with creating the, the world that you envisioned. And um, yeah, it was a really, a really fun process too, because I also work a lot in SketchUp and I could definitely see the limitations. So, well, we ended up using Fusion 360 mostly for developing the shapes. And it's also a really great pro program because it can export to AutoCAD and Rhino and all the other softwares that 
uh, the lovely art directors use. Especially kind of creating these organic structures, we really needed to make sure that, that every kind of curve that you and I had worked on was then followed through in the, um, in the final set. So it was a terrible thing for the, for the, the art department draft people to work on because, because they were organic shapes and they weren't just arcs in, in the set. They were really complex shapes. Um, so, uh, so it was very important that, that, that the software was kind of compatible with, with Rhino and all the different um, CAD packages that they were using. Yeah, which was great, as, I think, as well, because we, we did actually end up 3D printing some bits of it, um, you know, the maquettes, and we, we gave it to the sculptors who could then use that as well. And I, you were very adamant about us doing most, you know, almost everything in 3D fully so we can hand it off and, and, and make sure we have full control. Yeah, the workflow is very important to go from designing the sets in 3D, so producing 3D concept work, uh, and then on to um, drafting, and then from there on to 3D printing the, the large models that we, we produced of these large composite sets. And then ultimately using those same files to CNC whole chunks of scenery. So the curves that were on the, on the concept art are literally the same ones that, that are on the full size set. I mean, that's, yeah, it was amazing to have that, that connection between, between what I worked on with you straight you know that becomes the scenery so yeah that, that that process was amazing but then you raised the game and you brought in uh you suggested using vr as well yeah uh, i have some some friends that work in vfx and and they were talking about using you know vr on the lion king and all these other big mm. vfx productions and i i also know that they use it on on architectural visualization so i was like well our, our our series might not be as VFX heavy as some, but it is sort of like an artifice thing. So maybe maybe it could be useful. So I suggested it and I bought a kit and then threw some things in and it it really became a fundamental element to the way we design and review and iterate on, on all the sets that we came up with, I think, right? Yeah, amazing. I mean, it was amazing for so many different reasons. The, the VR was just incredible to see the sets, to stand inside them, especially the larger, the, the atrium set, and to be able to kind of walk around and, and not just kind of like stand still and, and look around, you know, but I could get right down and look underneath, you know, like the reception desks, the curves and the developments of the, of the shape uh, within the legs of the reception desk. And, and to be able to, to, to look at that with you but you can see it on a monitor. To have that ability was just mind blowing. So I'm actually physically walking around the set, giving notes like a year and a half before we, before we started building it at all. To be able to put Armando into the, into the set, and you know, and that early on, a year and a half before, he and I are walking around the set, kind of lining up shots and saying like, we could do a lovely little scene down here underneath the staircase and things. Just that ability was just, was mind blowing. And it's amazing how fast actually it just became normal. A couple of months ago when we started back up, I think we were, you know, getting some art directors into the VR as well to discuss things on, you know, how we're now working for series two and, and that sort of thing. And they could easily see, you know, some of the areas that they could improve on, make more efficient. Uh, you know, it's not just iterating and, and, and creating, uh, you know, improving on the shapes and the visuals of it. But, but, but throughout the, the production process, I think VR really helped us. I mean, this is a wonderful project because it was set on a, uh, on a cruise liner in space in the future. So, uh, and it's on its way to Saturn. So we're within the, uh, within the solar system. And that was just amazing as a concept because we had all the references of, of obviously kind of luxury cruise liners, uh, the Art Deco, 1930s kind of age of steam. Uh, an age of travel, um, as well as, you know, trying to pull in the, the modern elements of, of very, very kind of high tech um, uh, shopping malls and, and real cruise liners and, and beautiful hotels and airports and things. It was great fun kind of researching all those elements, um, but then to not, not use it, to kind of be aware of, of what is out there at the moment and what is seen as a, as a kind of future, future, futuristic design. But then to put that to one side and kind of like be aware of that, but then create our own kind of vision. We looked at everything we liked and, and, and sort of within the style that you envisioned. 
And then out of all of that, we, we came up with our own unique blend, our own unique type of tea, as you will, <laughs> you know, that, uh, that, that just encompassed everything we wanted to achieve. And, and, and uh, yeah, I think it worked really well. Um, it was also great fun that we had a lot of freedom because it was a comedy show. It wasn't a super serious, you know, realistic film, you know, based on real experiences or NASA or whatever. And even though it needed to be believable, we, we had a lot of freedom and, and that really gave us the opportunity to create something unique um, and, uh, well, something people hadn't really seen before. We had to slowly come up with that. It, it took a while, but but now we, we really established a style that we can, you know, iterate on, create different variations of it for different parts of the ship, different types of cabins, different, you know, the, the bridge and the, and the, the prayer room, two of my favorite sets there, they have, to, they share the same, you know, shape language and, and material language, but they're, they're, you know, different parts of the same family. The J pattern, I, I really love that we just put Judd and J's everywhere, mm -hmm. especially, of course, because I'm called Jord and my name starts with a J, but uh, <laughs> no, it's just great to, 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 to really take it way too far. I mean, it is way too far, but because it's a comedy, because it's supposed to be opulent and supposed to be taken way too far, it just makes sense and we can do everything with it. You know, even as far as the, the food on the, on the dining area trays, everything is J's and gold and, and glitter and it's, it's just ridiculous, but it, it just makes it really a lot more fun than some of the very serious, you know, dark projects I've worked on, I suppose. And then there's some things that are completely different again, like Judd's Cabin, which was also a lovely, just a completely different style altogether. But again, it, it, it sort of fits because it's, it's him, you know, it's, <laughs> it's just the way he would do things like the giant gold horses. Like a lot of my friends pointed it out. Like I love the horses. It's so ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> Actually the horses were another thing that, that were only ever um, 3d. They were, they were created in ZBrush um uh in in vr and then they were those files again were sent to the uh the cnc company and then they came in they were just sanded a bit painted gold and put on the set so uh, happily embracing that that technology in some areas obviously not in others but in some areas we can uh you know there's there's not a fingerprint on on some of the objects because they've only been through that kind of the the, the virtual world and, and then into the into being kind of computer carved out of huge blocks of polystyrene it's, uh, mm. it's fantastic yeah it's very exciting yeah and one of my favorite props i suppose you would call it is is the giant five meter long golden ship of course which is utterly crazy you, you make you make a concept model of a, of a ship and you're like all oh, right so it's a model and we had a small little you know mock-up of it and it's going to be a 3d model for vfx and then you were like we should totally just make a five meter long gold version out of it. I was like, yes. Because <laughs> <laughs> the, the concept of the ship was that the front half is really clean and pure white with gold, beautiful structures. And the rear half is like a really kind of, it's like an oil rig. It's grungy and dirty and it's got eye beams all over it and things. And it's kind of like things stuck together. But then I was thinking like, oh no, I'd love you to do a model of the ship, but you can't just do a model of the front half. So you'd have to do the whole thing. And then you did a render in, in all gold and suddenly it looked beautiful. All the, the kind of the angular kind of sections at the rear of the ship suddenly looked like diamonds because of the facets and things. It was amazing. So yeah, no, I would love that, that ship. It was, uh, yeah. it was very cool. There's always so many iterations behind every finished design that not a lot of people get to see. Like Judd's Cabin, for instance, I think we went through like five iterations, but it really shows because in the end, I think we, we really came up with something awesome that worked for everyone. Yeah, because we're having to deal, I mean, that's the part of the, um, the exploration of doing concept art is, is, is it in stages, you know, does it work for the action? You know, I think it works for the action, then I talk to the director and then the director sees the, the flow of a certain scene in a different way. So, okay, so now the doors are in the wrong place. So, okay, so let's take a step backwards on the design and then we have another go with the doors in a different place. And then that kind of works and then then we budget it and okay now it's costing too much money so let's pull it back and then let's change it so 
so it's uh, and again with with this industry so much is is born out of compromise and uh, and having to work with the materials and the time and and the people that you have that are available uh, and and suddenly you end up with something it just suddenly clicks and it's it's perfect you know and it's and it's like oh, I wish we just went straight in there got that got to the final step earlier on but actually the only way we got there was through that long winding process so well, the first thing actually worked right away like with the prayer room I think that was that was done really you know you, you had a clear vision of, of this church like feeling Ian worked with us on that as well um, yeah he did the initial thing we have to give a shout out to Ian I mean that was really based on my childhood memories of of uh, um, of growing up I, I lived near uh, um, Wells Cathedral in Somerset and there's this hidden little chapter house that you got up this kind of steep staircase and there's this large kind of round room with with like two steps all the, that run all the way around it and these beautiful kind of gothic uh, arches built into the structure so the prayer room is very much kind of representation of that space um, and the ceiling is is a representation of the of the ceiling at, in Wells Cathedral as well so that's kind of like dropped on on top and kind of stitched together um, no but I was really happy with that set the kind of the sinuous feel um, of the structure, uh, and as you say, actually connects very similar to the um, to the sinuous structure of the uh, the bridge as well. Yeah, no, absolutely, it's it's, it's really lovely, and uh, I also love just in the show seeing how the, the beautiful, serene vibe of that space is then, you know, just contrasted by dead people floating past. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you've enjoyed this little peek behind the curtain of the design of Avenue 5. Thank you for watching. Our course home has been set. There's a lot of people counting on us to get them there. Sarah, lights. No silver? Yep.